Hello and welcome. We are continuing with our um, discussions for the chapters that you have in your, your textbook. So we are going to cover today chapter 13. Chapter 13. We're still talking about the students um, or the children, I should say, uh, school age children. They're beginning to enter into school and they're developing in school lower elementary age what we're focusing on as the um, the middle middle childhood this is from ages 6 to 11 this is where they're able to uh, begin to master those culturally valued skills so in every culture what is um, what is indicative of a student or of an individual sorry I keep saying student as an educator what are the um, indications that you are an individual from your set culture. They begin to develop those skills. Um, they develop a sense of who they are in themselves. Are they uh, industrious? Are they a go-getter? Or are they inferior to everyone around them? That's the self-esteem issues. Are they competent? Because they have been challenged. They have um, gained mastery in those areas of being challenged in school. Or have they received those uh those a's and b's in school that have allowed them to become and to feel competent or are there some deficits that have not been addressed and so they feel incompetent academically all of this have been influenced by other individuals that's developing who they are as as an individual growing they learn to care for themselves it's important now for them to um take care of themselves this is where they are uh, understanding what dirty and clean is and, and how important um, it is to, to keep clean and to keep things uh, in order. We're still reinforcing the ideas of keeping a tidy space. They're being taught to be tidy in the, in the classroom. Again, all of this is being influenced by other individuals in their immediate um, environment. And then again, um, activities that they engage in they are learning about punishment and about reward, what's acceptable and what's not acceptable by their parents' awareness of approval. Now they they have an idea, I don't want to get in trouble. Um, I don't want my parents to be upset with me. Now that's becoming important uh, to them where it wasn't really important before. Um, a lot of comparison takes place at this age. This is the age, unfortunately, that bullying, that bullying is high, it's rampart. Uh, it's, it's high um, in this area uh, at this time in the child's development. Um, a lot of social comparison, um, prettier, uh, smarter, faster, slower. Those comparisons become really prominent, very vocal, very loud from children at this age. They're prettier, they're smarter, or I'm smarter, I'm prettier. Um, these This language begins to uh, become a part of your of a child's vocabulary. Um, and then if there's some, some differences there, again, they learn to vocalize those differences as well. Now we're gonna focus on a different individual. Before we focus on PSA, remember PSA talks about becoming aware of who you are. And so at different snapshots, different milestones, there is an awareness of who you are. But Erickson looks at the awareness of who you are compared to others. Erickson looks at the awareness only in context of in the social environment that they have been placed in that affects how they see themselves. So Erickson focuses on the concept or the construct of a child of industry versus inferiority. Um, it is the fourth of Erickson's eight psychosocial crisis, crises. Um, it's characterized by tension produced through productivity or incompetence. This is where it is important to encourage children and motivate children. Extrinsic motivation is very, very um, high here. And it is because you want to give the children a sense of accomplishment. Um, Self-pride is not really on actual accomplishments, but self-pride depends on how others view your accomplishments. 
and growth mindset develops. So it's not that the child is, <clears throat> is smart, but it's how the child's smartness is viewed. If the child's smartness is viewed negatively, then ladies and gentlemen, they will cease from looking, from behaving like they're smart, especially when no one else is reinforcing it. So if they're being overlooked at home and they're really smart, but no one at home is encouraging or supporting or letting them know that their smartness is a good thing and they come to school and they're being picked on for being smart. The teacher's pet, they always have their hand up. They know all the answers. And the teacher is not discouraging that type of behavior. The teacher has not taken that child and has now become, has allowed the child to become their protege or their mentee. And the child will cease from becoming or looking as if they're smart. And this is where you will find children that misbehave and the teacher will always say, they're so smart. They're so smart. Why are they doing these things? They're so smart. Because at this age, it doesn't matter how smart they are. It's the perception of their smartness that is important. <clears throat> and so if they learn that their smartness is important and they're supported by that, they become industrious. If they, if they understand or come to the conclusion that their smartness is a negative thing, they become inferior. The ability is still there, but they will no longer display it. And I just spoke about this as well. The academic and social competence, uh, competence is aided by the realistic self-perception, how they perceive themselves, how do others perceive them that will shape their own self-perception cultural influences. Now I use um, education, but this also goes into looks. This also goes into beauty. This also goes into the outward appearance. This is where you will find children that will bully because of the shoes that they have on. Well, if you don't instill in the child that if you get shoes from Walmart that cost 20 bucks, is just as good going to Foot Locker and getting shoes that cost 200 bucks, then your $20 shoes are perfect and continue to reinforce that idea when they go to school and a child misbehaves or, or, or bullies them or, um, or name call or, uh, or tease them about the shoes that they have on, that child will be able to say, it doesn't matter where I get my shoes from because I'm still good looking with my $20 shoes and I don't have to spend all that money on 20. They got that from their parents. <laughs> they didn't make it up on their own. They have been having their parents drill it into their into their hearing. And so they're repeating it in defense of themselves and they're okay. But if the if they're being told that this is all that I can afford and I can't do anything else, and they perceive that this is a bad thing, and when they get to school and they see someone else with two hundred dollar shoes, and now they're being teased about their twenty dollar shoes. Well, now the child will feel bad because they felt bad leaving home. It has been drilled into their mind. This is all that we have. This is a level of poverty that we are experiencing. And this is the best that I can do. Well, now the child will find ways to come out of that sense of poverty to match up to what someone else has and what they see. And now they desire and they covet those things on their own. So again, we have to be careful in the manner of how we display certain information to the children in our environment. <clears throat> Resilience. Children are very resilient at this age. They, um, they adapt well. And contrary to what we think, they adapt well uh, to adversity and they overcome serious stress. Don't know how. I, I wish that we could take more pages from children. They adapt well, they just, they just get over it. But there are some areas of sensitivity that if are not um, captured and 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 taught, uh, captured and uh, and redirected, it could become a problem later on. So even though they are adapting, it doesn't mean that they um, or have not been uh, sent. Uh, they have not been damaged. It's not. It wasn't a sensitive area. They've been damaged in that area, and it'll manifest itself later on. Uh, there's an episode of um, Strange Addictions 
that I, I would show my um, my students that I, I taught in another another campus. And there was an episode where um, the the adult um, the adult woman um, sucks her thumb and and she sucks her thumb in public. I mean, she sits at a restaurant and she sucks her thumb. And when she finally went to a counselor, it recursed it back to her childhood. Her parents had gone through a divorce. Now on the outward appearance, she was resilient. She did fine, her grades didn't fall back, but she found comfort in sucking her thumb and having a little blanket with her. So on one end, she was resilient in that she didn't succumb to the situation by falling to pieces. But she, there was some damage there. It was, she was sensitive in that area that caused some long lasting damage on the other end. So although she has a job, although she has a well-paying job, although she has um, pretty good relationships, she's a 20 some odd woman that walks around and sucks her thumb. <laughs> so something didn't translate the way that it should have. Um, resilience is dynamic. Resilience um, is a positive adaptation. So that may have been her positive adaptation to the adversity that was there, but the adversity um, was significant, but where she positively adapted as a child because it wasn't molded or redirected or or um, or guided through, the resilient act that she did at that time became maladaptive behavior as she grew older. And then accumulated stress over time is the minor things. Um, but they lead to a more uh, devastating outcome um, as they continue to experience the stress versus the most devastating issue um, that happens when a uh, event is is high, highly stressful. So those little nuances that will kind of eat away over time creates a, a, a reaction or behavior that really was anticipated because it's been little bit by little bit. This is where you will find um, domestic violence. Perhaps the uh, the the husband has been in a in a real strenuous um, relationship with with his wife or you know with with whomever, and over time it has been stressful. Maybe someone is more co uh, career oriented than the other, um, and so over time. Um, they manage and there's, you know, it builds up and then all of a sudden they come home and the husband is no longer there or the wife is no longer there or whomever is no longer there. You're like, what happened? And then the, the rebuttal is, well, how could you not see this coming? <laughs> you were never this and you were never that. And because it wasn't addressed, it becomes accumulated versus um, a situation where someone loses their job and they they come home and um, everyone in the house knows it was devastating and it is major stressful for that person and they see the results of it immediately. <clears throat> um, when things, and we have to understand with accumulated stress, it makes resilience difficult because it happens over and over and over and over again. So if anything, if you think of um, rocks <clears throat> along the shore of a beach, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> rocks along the shore of a beach as the water continues to crash over that those rocks on the beach, then gradually the water will weaken the minerals of those rocks and those rocks will begin to break apart. It'll chip away. So where you will have a larger size rock over the period of many years of the water rushing or crashing over that rock, the rock will begin to chip away and now it'll reduce in size. That's the same way with repeated stress and the resiliency of a person. As the stress continues to wash over that person over and over again, that resilience to overcome, that resilience to rise above, it becomes more challenging. And the person will sometimes just give up and that may end in some very devastating results. It may end in suicide. It may end in homicide. It may end in dr uh, drinking problems or drug abuse. It may end in mis um, maladaptive behavior and disorderly conduct. It may result in things because the stress 
is repeated and the resiliency diminishes. And in talking about children, um, some of those examples of uh, repeated stress would be um, disruption of schooling. This is why attendance is, a, is important. Um, frequent moves, moving wherever there's, um, there's a special an apartment living, not having a stable situation, all of those different changing caregivers, moving um, different individuals coming into the homes of, of, the, of the, the parent. Um, stability is important for children this age. Stability is important, very, very important. It adds stress, uh, constantly moving, uh, even in the school system, teachers that constantly quit, that creates stress in the children. It doesn't matter that the children are misbehaving. If you're not gonna say in the, in the field, then don't enter in. That's, that's kind of my own little personal take on it because as you keep moving and keep leaving, it creates stress in the children. It stresses them out. That when they come in, there's a different sub or there's a, they've had three different teachers in one school year. It creates stress in the child. And so you will find, um, I remember my experience in teaching at a, at a school, um, the children just couldn't believe that I, I was gonna come back the next year. They were like, you know, um, are you coming back next year? <laughs> and I was like, as far as I know, yes. <laughs> but they were like, you know, cause the last year you didn't come back and everyone that we get, they leave. And so they were just, uh, it was just something that I came back every year for, for about three years. I mean, the group that I work with, I, I, I graduated them out. It was some little third graders and I, I worked with them for third, fourth and fifth. And they did well, not because of anything um, fantastic that I was doing, but I was a sense of stability for them. I hardly missed. And when I wasn't feeling well, I made sure that they were taken care of. I made sure to convey that I may not be feeling well. I may not come back tomorrow but I'm coming back and I'm going to make sure that you're in good hands. And even whenever I would leave and maybe not tell them that I wasn't coming the next day, like, you know, where were you? <laughs> where were you and what's going on? And if I told them that my children were sick, well, you couldn't just, you know, call someone. I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. I have a family too, but it's because they were this, that, that instability that stresses children out. And so anything that, any way that we can be consistent, it's really helpful for the students or for children at this age. And so um, some other coping measures to reduce the impact of repeated stress is the interpretation of family situation. If there's something going on, then call a family meeting and give it to the children in, in child language. You don't have to give them all the details let them know what's going on so they understand what's happening at that time they have you can reduce stress for them development of friends and activities and skills uh, make sure they're involved in something in some community um, um, organization or events get them involved though you know making sure that they have um, a, a system of, uh, of support um, Participation in school success and after school activities is important for them to not be as stressed. Maybe if they're having some challenges with their family dynamics at home, if there's some family issues, or if they're among um, peers doing something constructive, then it takes, just like with us, it takes off the stress, takes the edge off. Involvement in the community, church and other programs, uh, getting the children involved. Um, speaking for myself as a, a single mother, there's a lot of things that happens in the dynamics of my of my my hub. Um, some things that I experience that I don't experience that may not be um, translated well with my with my children. It can become stressful for them at times, and so I have a heavy involvement uh, with them in in church. They're heavily involved because I want them to have a, an outlet an outlet with uh, and the children there and, and the other adults there, a healthy outlet um, that they're able to take with them wherever they're going to help them cope with sometimes the things that I cannot handle or I have no control over of my own. And so they have other ways to reach out and to connect with others so that they're not stressed because I need them to be resilient. I, I can kind of handle some things differently, 
but as a child, they may not have that same level of um, knowledge and, and understanding to handle things the same way. So I want them to have other means of being able to handle um, that information. A shared and non-shared environments. Um, the influence of shared environment uh, shrinks with age. Uh, the effect of non-shared environment increases. So at this age is what's happening in the house um, begins to decrease for now. It decreases its influence on the child. So this is where friends are very, very important because they don't they don't live with their friends. They don't live with so these other individuals. And so their opinion matters. How many of us have, have said that we have said the same thing, but someone else will say it and the children are like, okay, we got it. Like that was the best piece of advice I have ever heard. And you're like, really? I just said that. <laughs> this is because at this age, um, they are learning more about those outside influence. The outside influences are important to them. Unfortunately, fortunately, it's important. And so if, if you're wise, if some of the parents are wise, they may develop relationships with the parent, with the teachers. That's a tip for you. Develop relationships with the teachers so that the teachers can convey the same information that you're saying at home to reinforce so you work together. So when the teacher says that what they did is not right, then the child should be able to say, that's the same thing my parents said. And now they're going to listen to the teacher because the teacher said it, and they're gonna come back and honor what you have been saying. So that's a little, little tip for you. If you are a parent and you have children that are in school, develop a relationship with the teacher so the teacher can support what you're doing because the influence of the teacher at this age will matter more than yours. And then here's some information here. Um, remember a few tips. Children raised in the same household by the same parents do not necessarily share the same home environment. There are some differences there. Changes in family affect every family member differently, depending on age and or gender. I remember when um, the addition of my uh, baby daughter was added to the family, my eldest daughter was like, wow, what just happened? And now they are, um, they're blended well, they, they behave, but I've had to cultivate, um, I have ha I've had to cultivate that relationship. Because before it was it was only my daughter and she received everything in my own place of understanding. And so when the baby came in, she was like, she just took my place. <laughs> like I've been replaced. And so I had to cultivate a lot of their coming together and loving each other as sisters and my kind of moving out of the way. I've noticed recently and I, I had to look and I smiled to myself, but I was a little bit, just a little bit um, twing of a, of a hurt there, a little sting there, where before my baby would kind of put her, put her, her head on my shoulder, but I noticed that she's been putting her head on her sister's shoulder. And I was like, that's awesome, but ouch. But it's what I wanted. I want them to develop a bond with each other. And so um, that has to be cultivated. And so parents have to respond to children, especially at this age, a little bit differently. And even now I have to respond to my children differently because they are they are different people. Um, family structure, family function are two ways that are heavily influence, uh, influential factors upon the children at this age. Um, living in the same home, the nuclear extended family, step family, others, how the family works to meet the needs of its members, how you work together. I try to teach my daughters that we're, this is a team unit. We work together. We're going to do things together. We're going to help each other out. Those things help um, to support the learning, um, the adaptability, the resiliency of children as they become adults. Um, 
material necessities to encourage learning, making sure that the children have what they need to learn, making sure they come to school with supplies. If the teacher's asking for a notebook and a, a composition notebook, then just get it. <laughs> just get it. Because the child coming to school with a single subject notebook when everyone else have a composition notebook, it causes a, a, little, a little sting in their development. And the parents say it's just a notebook, but everyone else has a composition notebook and you sent the single subject notebook because it was just 50 cents and you didn't want to spend the dollar for the composition notebook. Well, now the child will go to school upset that they don't have a composition notebook and it may be displayed and they're not paying attention in class. It may be displayed and they're being angry when they come to that class and the teacher has no idea why. And the child is not going to ask for a composition notebook because culturally that's not acceptable. And they were told at home to be satisfied with what you have. On the, in the meanwhile, they're suffering all because of 50 cents. They're suffering over 50 cents. So whatever is needed, and I wish I could tell this to, to parents, but you can't really, uh, maybe I could, but you really, really can have this conversation with with uh, with parents unless you're given the opportunity to just get the child what they need because it's important to be validated by the opinions of others at this age and then when they get into high school and the teacher says i need a composition notebook the child can decide well mom dad the teacher said they want a composition notebook but it's not that big of a deal this little notebook right here is just fine i'll settle for that and they can go to school, they can defend their 50 cent single subject notebook and they didn't want to get the composition notebook, but they have to get it at this age so they can decide when they get, when they get older. If you decide for them at the younger age, then they carry that bitterness when they and then as, when they become older, they're still, now it's something else that they wanted and they couldn't get and it's reminding them of what they didn't get when they were younger. So now it's, it's adding on, it's adding on to it. And now you're not understanding why they're acting out, but it all stems back to a 50 cent, a dollar composition notebook. It helps to develop um, self-respect. Now they fit in because they have the same notebook that everyone else have. And, and parents, if you really want to just wow your child, where everyone else is getting a black composition notebook, get them, Get them a red one, get them a green one, get them different colors. And now you're building up the self-respect of this is what I have and no no, um, no limitations were put on, on getting what I needed to be successful in school. Now they have friendships. Well, this is what, you know, what I have and oh, this is nice. I like this blue one. Like, yeah, you know, my mom or my dad got this one for me. It's really nice. Oh, and you have a yellow one too. I wish that I, I would tell my mom to get me different colors too. Like, oh, and now you have a friendship over a dollar composition notebook and it fosters harmony and stability. Oh, well, I have an extra green one. You can have this one or we can trade. You don't have to ask your, your mom or dad to go buy you one. We can just trade. I have this red one. I really don't like red, but I'll take the black one. And now it fosters harmony and it provides stability. And now they're settled in with knowing that they have, they look like everyone else and they have contributed to the happiness of someone else all over some composition notebooks. And so by providing basic material necessities, encouraging learning, helping them to develop self-respect, allowing them to now create nurturing friendships, fostering harmony and stability, now you are moving that child in the positive direction as they go into teenage years. <laughs> Uh, continuity for U.S. children and military families, stay home dads. Um, some information here for you to read at your own, at your leisure. Uh, just what's happening there when the dads decide to, sw to swap out roles and stay home. Um, however, some of those psychological needs um, from being in, in combat as, as far as the military may uh, 
may have to be treated with medicine. And so the child has to learn a few things as they're working with, uh, with their father um, at home um, and being under that type of uh, supervision. So again, a child will flourish uh, or suffer in many structures and it all goes into what you're, what you're teaching, nuclear family, um, flourish or suffer their single parent family, extended family, and then polygamous families. Um, polygamous families is just where uh, the father has multiple children um, and perhaps uh, the father uh, may not be um, present in those different families where the children are uh, or they may be and so now you may have uh, three children that has the same father but has different mothers and the father in their attempts to bring their children together will now bring these children together and it's polygamous it's polygamous in nature because um, they don't know what to what to what to talk about it's just flourish or suffer because they they want the father for themselves but it's not happening because the father is is with all those families and so it's polygamous in nature and uh the children suffer uh, and then we know about the nuclear family where there's two in a home single parent we have information about that and extended um that may be just with uh, maybe some long distance, um, maybe with other family members that are contributing to the household. So children can either flourish or suffer. <clears throat> and then two parent homes, again, those are your nuclear families, um, step parent families, adoptive families, um, same sex, and then skip generational families where you may have uh, perhaps um, mother and grandmother um, in the home. You may have a uh, mother and and the, the uncle or mother and the aunt and our father and brother, brother of the father, uncle, our father and, and sister, sister and brother in the home. Um, and they, they happen to have, for whatever the reason may be, um, they're kind of raising the children together so that we consider the nuclear nuclear family a single parent we know the definition of that could be single mother never married single mother divorced separated or widow single father same um applic uh, applicable statements never married divorced widow or separated or grandparent grandmother mostly a uh, predominantly grandmother raising children um maybe grandfather alone raising children um, I know it's not here, but um, sometimes you have aunts um, that are raising children. Maybe they never had children on their own, but they're raising the children of the sister or raising the children of the brother. That would still be considered a single parent family. I'm not sure why it's not listed. Maybe it's listed on the next slide. It's not, <laughs> sorry, but it is another dynamic of single parent families and, and vice versa. If there's a, maybe a, a brother that's raising his brother's children, he doesn't have any children, he's raising his brother's children for whatever the reason may be or raising his sister's children because no one else is there to take the place to be a parent to those children. That would also be considered a single parent family home. And then as you can see here, the um, how this looks culturally in those different categories of um, of households. So you can see that the married and single mother, um, it's not too far behind in the black community. And so a lot of attention um, is given in this area, but I'm not sure how much attention is sustainable in this community. And that's a discussion for a later time. I'm just not sure what else can be done um, at this time. Um, culture and family. <sighs> C 
culture and family. Um, so again, I want to kind of move past this slide. Uh, culture and family structure. Um, I'll let you read this one on your own. You can make your own opinions about that. Not much to say about this one. Uh, insight from scholars is just the thoughts and opinions of um, the different family structures and how it impacts the children as they grow older. Um, you can read that between this and your textbook. You should be able to form your own understanding about what is being uh, what's being said. Um, two factors that increase the likelihood of dysfunction in every structure, ethnic group, and nation is money um, and then the safety of where you're of where you're living. That's for anybody, wealth or poverty um, or high conflict. Family stress model, we talked about that. Conflict, talked about that a, a little bit anyway, we touched upon it. Um, we know conflict and harms children, especially when adults are fighting about how to raise the children. And this is why there's a lot of breakdown in families because of the conflict that is ensued when talking about rearing children, especially with um, families coming, blended families, conflict um, shows, shows there. Um, and it has to be taken care of because it harms the children and it, it, it influences who they become later on. Uh, culture of children, um, particular habits, styles, and values that reflect the set of rules and rituals that characterize children as distinct from adults. So they want to be different. They, they don't want to look like an adult. They want to be seen distinctively different from the adults in their community. So you will see that they will dress differently. They will speak differently. They will have friends. Pure culture will be a heavy influence. Their attitudes will be different. And they want to be independent. I don't know why, but they want to be independent from adults. They want to do it themselves. And then when they become older, they want your help, right? <laughs> but for a long time, they want to be um, distinct from the adults. And TV does a lot to support this. I, I don't know why. TV does a lot to reinforce this idea of adults are mean and we don't want to be like an, like adults. We want to be children. Children are better than adults. Even whenever I remember in teaching, um, and sometimes they have like uh, these sports games and it's always teachers versus students. And I'm like, why? <laughs> like we're, we're adults. You would think that you want to have a teacher on your side because they're, they're adults, but they wanted to teachers versus students. And if the students won against the teachers, I mean, they just, they just harass you and tease you forever because they beat you <laughs> in a game of basketball or volleyball. And so it's that whole culture of children where they want to be distinctively different and separate from the from the uh, adults in 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 the society. So friendships are important. They value personal friendship more than peer acceptance. So if they have one person on their side, they're okay. Um, it leads to psychosocial growth and it provides a buffer against psychopathology. If you notice. There are individuals that suffer from uh, psychopathic behaviors. They don't have any friends. No, they don't. They don't have any friends. Um, if you look at the, those at the Columbine shoot, shooting, they didn't have any friends. So no one, no one noticed or cared why they walked in the way that they did. They didn't have any friends. Um, the individuals that did the different uh, school shootings, they didn't have any friends. So when they came in looking the way that they looked, no one questioned and said, hey, you know, where are you going? Or call them out because they didn't have any friends. So again, friendships provide a buffer against psychopathology uh, or psychopathological behavior. Um, the gender differences, when boys have friendships, they play more active games. And when girls have friendships, they talk and they share, they talk more and they share secrets. So even in looking at my my, my darling daughters, 
I'm noticing as they are developing their friendship with each other, they talk a lot more. So I'm somewhere working and I just hear them chatting, just chatting, 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 laughing and giggling. And I'm just like, wow, they're developing, they're becoming friends. They're becoming friends. Um, and so that leads to popular, unpopular children. Popular children um, are kind, trustworthy, cooperative. Uh, they're usually athletic. Sometimes they're athletic, they're cool, dominant, arrogant, aggressive around fifth grade you'll see that a lot of influence you'll see these characteristics being displayed unpopular or neglected aggressive rejected with withdrawn and rejected so they're by themselves and that kind of leads them into maybe exhibiting some behavior that is just not healthy which leads to bullying bullying and then a bully victim you have an assignment on bullying um, what's interesting to note is that bullying, most times bullying can be stopped if someone is a friend and says something. You may not be, a, be the individual's friend, but just being a friend would stop bullying. But most children are seeing that they're not my friend, so I'm not obligated to say anything because they're not my friend. And so they won't, and if they say anything, what do I say because it's not my friend? But if they are, if I'm taught to be a friend, then I will step in and I will say something. Sometimes when they say something, it backfires. Now they're the target of the bullying and no one is there to friend them out. So if they're not, if they don't know if anyone is gonna friend them out, then they won't be a friend to, that, to someone that's being bullied and the child will continue to be bullied and will sometimes cause um, some really, uh, horrible things to happen. David's law is a is an example of bullying. David's law with the cyber bullying, that happened because a child was bullying by children from another school. The child at that school, he was everyone's friend. He was he was a friend and he was befriended. But children from another school for whatever their reasons were started bullying that child and there was no one there to friend him out. So the child suffered. And remember at this age, the opinion of others is more important than the opinion of his parents. And so he didn't tell his parents anything. And he suffered for months of other children bullying him and he never said anything. And eventually he committed suicide. And when his parents finally discovered all that happened, they went to the court, to the Supreme Court and they enacted and they fought for this cyber bullying to stop. And it was named after their child and his name was David. So David's law is because of bullying, cyber bullying, and that there was no one there to friend him out. Um, and so bully victim, again, is someone who attacks others and who is attacked as well. So we have heard that most times bullies are being bullied themselves. And so they're they're being bullied and then they'll bully someone else in, in a, a, a way to kind of take away the victim feeling that they have and to know what it feels like to be empowered. So they're being bullied by someone and then they'll bully someone else as a, as a retaliation or um, a response to what they're feeling from someone else. So it's called provocative, uh, provocative victim because he or she, they're doing things that elicit bullying, um, maybe stealing the person's, stealing the bully's pencil. Um, they will, uh, they'll fight back um, because they're being, they're being attacked. So the types of bullying, we know that there's physical, that we see um, some verbal, that this one is very popular, the verbal teasing, uh, relational teasing. You see this when perhaps um, something embarrassing happened, take a picture of it and they show it. Sometimes this happens in high school and <clears throat> middle school where maybe there's um, a relationship between uh, two, two individuals and maybe they're being told to send some provocative pictures and then a relationship goes sour and then they'll send these pictures to everyone that they can. Um, and now it's uh, destroying um, the, the image that that person had with other people. Sometimes it's done intentionally, 
Sometimes it's not. We see movies of that. Um, again, media has really heightened and has really given a lot of horrible ideas of how to bully people. <laughs> and yet we wonder why bullying is so prevalent because they're getting a bunch of ideas from TV. <laughs> um, and then of course there's cyber, uh, cyber bullying. And so who suffers more, boys or girls? Consequences, um, impaired social understanding, lower school achievement, relationship difficulties, depression. Yes, children can be depressed. Um, it could lead to, to suicidal or to harm. Self-infliction, all consequences of bullying. Um, to eliminate bullying, the whole school gets involved. There are some things that are done, um, whole school, uh, you know, reporting bullying. If you see it, you don't have to stop it, but you have to report it. These different things of trying to help and support children as, you know, that those that are being bullied, um, intervention, um, and then taking some measures against bullying. I know for, at one time, there was a zero tolerance law um, or zero tolerance rule in, in some schools where there is absolutely no tolerance of bullying, whether it's verbal, whatever it is, is zero tolerance. There's a suspension and all these other things that are put in place, zero tolerance. Um, it has some kickback from it where they would kind of sneak around to do it. It was still being done. So we're still battling bullying. I think this whole pandemic has kind of shut down a lot of bullying because we're all at home. <laughs> So uh, I'm sure though, I'm not sure, but the bullying rates have gone down. So just be maybe it'll, whenever we all go back, uh, we'll see what happens there. Uh, moral development is prime at this age. Moral judgments, universal principles um, from conventional norms are being established. Peer culture, personal experience, empathy is established at this time. It's important to teach the child what's right and what's wrong and what hurts people's feelings and what doesn't. And whenever someone is feeling bad to empathize with them and not use it as a point of, um, of joke or, or uh, ill gestures. Criticisms of teaching moral values. Um, they use their understanding to judge what's, what's right or wrong, which is good, but then culture and gender can be ignored uh, family not included, um, and the difference between child and adult morality are not addressed. So even if I recurse back to the example that I, I gave about the child um, watching Jackie Robinson on the field, okay, the child had to understand that this wasn't right. This is not, you're hurting someone's feelings, like this is not right. But because my dad did it, it must be acceptable. And it was never addressed. And so they felt that it was okay. And so what children value at this age, um, close family members, cooperating with other children, not hurting anyone intentionally. This is where I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And they feel remorse, this, this shows up, this is developed. Um, adult versus peers, they protect their friends. They start to do things with their friends that are not pleasing with their parents, but it's because of their friends, they'll do it. Um, so they won't tell. Again, with David's law, he didn't tell. And he accepted because he didn't want to be different. Like he wanted the bullying to stop, but he didn't say stop because he didn't want to be different from those. He wanted to find out. He would rather try to make or figure out ways to make the bullying stop by blending in, by being nice, by ignoring it, by being pushed, by being pulled, by taking the slurs, hoping that it'll all go away, rather than saying, this is who I am, I'm courageous, you can't do this to me, you can't tell me that, because that would be different from his peers. No one else does that. So he'd rather take the insult to seem I'm just like you, please stop. Then telling you, I'm just like you, please stop verbally. And he didn't want to tell his parents. So his best option to get away from everything, because they were not changing, 
in their position of, of what they were doing to him. He did not want to tell his parents because he didn't want them to bully him more. His best solution was to commit suicide. Um, developing moral values, moral judgment becomes more comprehensive, taking into account psychological as well as physical harm intentions. Um, all of this uh, has to be taken into developing a child morally. Don't do this. Keep your hands to yourself. All these different things are being taught at this age. Uh, raising more value, uh, more issues, um, letting the children talk about them um, may advance morality eventually, but not immediately. So keep talking, keep teaching. Teachers, we, we keep teaching. That's not nice. You shouldn't do that. Even though we see them do it the next day, eventually they'll get it. <laughs> if they're taught it, they'll get it. Um, and letting them talk about things that are not right. I know Nickelodeon does um, a, a bit of um, letting the children talk about uh, different things. They developed a um, children's constitution where they have a right to different things, kind of giving them their own autonomy. It's still that separate child from a versus adult, but it's empowering the child to speak against it, things that are not right that are happening. When they had the um, Black Power movement, there was a little bit on Nickelodeon. It got a little bit of a kickback at first, but it's still there. Some of it is still there anyway, of letting the children have a voice about what is uh, morally unacceptable and voicing their opinion about it versus it all coming from the adults. And so that would um, advance morality. Hopefully those children that have been given a voice to express what's morally unacceptable, or morally wrong, when they become older, then they will behave differently because they have been able to say something when it happened earlier. And so Kohlberg's level of moral thought is put into place. Um, first, we will behave um, to avoid punishment. That's pre-conventional moral reasoning. Then we will behave because it's socially acceptable. And then post-conventional is that we will behave because it's just the right thing to do. It emphasizes moral principles. You treat others the way that you wanna be treated. So if I take that, um, I'm not gonna hit you because I don't wanna get caught. And if I get caught, I'm gonna get in trouble. <laughs> and then I am not gonna hit you because the teacher said it's not nice to hit. And then I'm not going to hit you because I want to be treated in a good way. So I'm not going to do to you what I don't want done to me. Those are your three levels. And we are still kind of fluid in those areas. Time and talking. What happens when you give children time to talk of how their behavior changes versus no time to talk and what they continue to do. And that brings us to the end of chapter 13. Um, it's lengthy, I'm sorry. It's lengthy, I'm sorry, but we're here. And so fast forward when you need to, but I do hope it accompanies um, your reading. Until next time, um, please, please, please take care.